Good evening and thank you for joining today's web seminar featuring Dr. Roel Mora. Your moderators for this evening are Dr. Peggy Albers, Professor of Language and Literacy at Georgia State University in Atlanta, Georgia, USA, and me, Tuba Angai Crowder, Language and Literacy Doctoral Student at Georgia State University. We have also a research team of doctoral students from Georgia State University and a doctoral student from the University of Pennsylvania. GCLR as a research project seeks volunteers for our study of critical literacy pro uh, professional development in online spaces. If you are willing to participate in a brief interview, please type your email address into the chat area and a research team member will contact you within a few days to schedule an appointment. We also invite you to take our survey. The hyperlink is located on the GCLR website. The data collected will provide important information for understanding professional development as it is delivered through online technologies and its impact on international literacy discussions. During today's web seminar, if you have any comments or questions, please type them into the chat box and Dr. Moray will address these at the end of his presentation. We would love to know from where you are participating in this web seminar. So please use the chat box to type in from where you are watching this seminar or place a star on your location. Raul Alberto Mora is a professor of English Education and Literacy at UPB Medellin in Colombia. At his university, he currently coordinates the MA in Learning and Teaching Processes in Second Languages. He is the author of many book chapters and articles. Among them are City Literacies in Second Languages, New Questions for Policy and Advocacy and Critical Literacy as Policy and Advocacy, Lessons from Colombia. Dr. Morrow participates on several editorial boards, including Journal of Adolescent and Adult Literacy, where he currently serves as a Policy and Advocacy Department Editor, and the editorial boards for Profile, and half journals in Colombia. Today's seminar will introduce questions that Dr. Mora and his research team have explored in their research agenda at the Literacies in Second Languages Project, LSLP. At this time, please join me in welcoming Dr. Ro Alberto Mora and his presentation entitled Rethinking Today's Language Ecologies, New Questions About Language Use and Literacy Practices. Dr. Mora, you're on. Um, Dr. Mora, we cannot hear you. How about... Now, how about now? Can, can, everybody, can everybody hear me now? Wonderful. 
wonderful. I sometimes technology plays those tricks on you, but um, I guess we're good to go. Um, so first of all, I want to welcome everybody to our session. Um, Thinking today's language colleges new questions about language use and literacy practices. Um, before I begin, I think it's fair to give a little bit of credit what credits do. And I want to first of all thank the uh, GCLR team, particularly Peggy Albers and Drew Bangay Crowder, for the invitation and the support in putting this together. I always like to thank my wife because she's probably my biggest fan and friend and she keeps all our support while I'm doing all these things. A big shout out to my own alma mater, the University of Illinois. Uh, our partners around the world, but most importantly, I want to take a second to acknowledge the great work and commitment of my research team, because without their work, without their interest in research, and without their concern about literacy, this presentation would never have happened. Um, this presentation builds up from the research we have conducted at LSLT for the past three years. Um, which comprises about four research projects. The work that we've been doing at the Master of Arts in Learning and Teaching Processing in Second Languages, and a series of publications, local presentations, international conference presentations that we have conducted over the time we've established the project. Uh, my presentation will try to encompass two things I have been working both individually and with my team um, since 2011. One is the problematization we've done of the idea of foreign language and why we need second languages in plural, and how that dovetails into our current work with the Literacy in Second Languages project and some examples of our current research. Um, an important thing, because I brought this up in the title, it's discussing very briefly what language ecology is. And we use the idea of language ecology using the metaphor of an ecosystem. And if, an, if in an ecosystem, you have all the elements that are supposed to coexist. If you take something out of the equation or you insert something into the ecosystem, the ecosystem is going to lose its balance and ultimately uh, it's going to suffer. And we use the same metaphor for languages. If you have languages in contact and one, and they're not working to sustain a balance in, the, in this linguistic ecosystem, we're going to suffer language loss, we're going to suffer um, unequal language practices, we're going to suffer linguistic um, discrimination and other matters. So that's why the concept of language ecology is so important to us, because it helps us understand that when we talk about languages, when we talk about literacy practices, we have to frame this in the sense of um, a more equitable society. Now, us they mentioned I'm in Colombia. Um, that's a little map of the country. As you can see, it's a very it's a, it's a wide country with a lot of diversity. The country comprises 32 departments of provinces with 45 million inhabitants, um, where Spanish is an official language. But at the same time, we have 67 languages that are indigenous, recognized by the government, two Afro-Colombian languages, the Romani language, and the Colombian Sign Language. However, and I find this to be baffling on many levels, our national bilingual plan usually only encompasses English and Spanish. So that's quite problematic if you think about it. Um, so there's the question, why talk about second languages and why talk about it today? First of all, because the way language is happening today is very complex. Technology, social mobility, Migration is affecting the way people play with languages, the way people appropriate languages. And that implies that people are finding new ways to play with language and finding new ways to use language and own it. Then we have matters of language equity, language access, language values that are present and becoming more and more important. Issues with life in borderlands. Uh, and how borderlands have played at creating new senses of languages and new ways to play language. And then the virtual environments where you have no boundaries, where you have no borders, where everybody is on the same level playing field. And with that sense, we have been problematizing this notion, the traditional notion of foreign language, which in the way I see it, is mostly geographical 
in the sense that if you're in the United States, then it's second language. If you're in Colombia, it's foreign language. If it's Britain, it's a, it's a second language. If it's China, it's a foreign language. If it's Ireland, it's a um, first language or um, second language. If it's Russian, it's a foreign language. And also, because this notion of foreign language seems to set very constrained glass ceilings in our students. So you can only learn this much because you're here. But if you were in another country, you could learn this much, and that doesn't make any sense. In this, and it's also um, a source of a lot of social inequality, uh, and I think anybody who's taught English as a, as a different language um, has knows very well this issue of native speakers and non-native speakers and how problematic that is in terms of the social constructions that we create about all the quality of teaching. So let me give you two examples um, from Colombia where I feel that foreign language becomes irrelevant to say in a way. And one is the example of the San Andres paradox. San Andres Providencia and Santa Catalina, it's a province in Colombia. It's an island in the Caribbean. And I had the chance to visit in 2012 to visit for the Minister of Education. And we were discussing issues of languages and standards and policy, and I posed this paradox to them. In San Andres, we have three languages in contact. Spanish, which is the official language of Colombia. English, which is the traditional language of religion that has been in the island since the 1600s. And Creole, that is recognized, as I mentioned previously, as the native language of the local inhabitants of the island. So my question is a question I usually challenge all my students with this question is, in this particular case, which of these three languages would you label as the foreign language? And that becomes problematic because I don't, I don't think you can label any of them as a foreign language. They all have particular reasons and particular logics, and in, in they work in particular, in particular um, ways. Then there's the second example, and these are two schools that there's no need to name names, but I'll give you the context of the two schools. One school has two or three English teachers per grade, very few students per classroom, a lot of instruction per week. They have access to multiple resources, including online resources in English. Um, their teachers are either native speakers or advanced speakers of English, and they have a lot of chances to, to practice outside at school. They got immersions, they have at home. And then you have the second school, which may have one or two teachers in the entire school to teach English, with a very large classroom, very few hours a week, and very little access or real to the class. So my question here is, if you look at the curriculum and the structure of this first school in Medellin, do you see there an EFL, a foreign language structure, or is it something that resembles more a second language structure? And in that particular sense, what we have is a, is a very glaring social inequality. And in that particular sense, those of us in literacy, we cannot condone frameworks that could lend themselves to social inequality. So that's why we have proposed the idea of second languages as a plural term. Um, this definition that you have here, it belongs to it's a working definition by two of the researchers from LSLP, um, and they wrote a micro paper about it. And as you see, they talk about the idea that we care more about practice, we care more about appropriation, we care more about the use of language in as a social phenomenon, as opposed to using the traditional yardsticks for um, for language that we use as proficiency or level or it, it, things that don't really give on a, a fair account of how people use languages in real life. And from this idea of second languages, we, in 2012, we established the Literacy in Second Languages project. Um, and we find our work interesting for our context because the issue of bilingualism, it's, it's a very big priority for the country, for the city, for the provinces. Um, we have, for example, right now, the latest version of the, of the bilingual policy in Colombia is called Colombia Very Well. Um, all universities are now requiring a particular proficiency level, usually it's B2, from the Common European Framework for regular professionals and for um, 
language teachers, the expectation is C1 in the Community European Framework. Then if we find more language centers, there is more interest in learning English, there is more push for like journals and newspapers to publish articles in, in English. But at the same time, there seems to be a social imaginary, particularly in our hometown, where people still think that Medellin is monolingual and that people don't speak English, so to speak. And that if you look at English and other languages around the city, you're gonna find very little, if anything at all. And we decided to play with that a little bit. And we provide this apparel and shift. So instead of looking for speakers of a language, we decided to start looking for people who used the language, um, independent, I mean, regardless of proficiency. We started, we started wondering how to use the language as a resource and how this resource enriches the literacy practices in the city. And we stopped thinking about the idea that we have to bring second languages to the city, that we have to bring English to the city, and we started assuming that what if the language is already here? And what if don't know how this language um, appears in the city? And we started looking at literacy practices outside the traditional circles, and we started looking at the city as a source of literacy, but not being judgmental about the literacy. We want to look at kind of narratives, but we don't want to start judging whether people can speak English or whether they're proficient or whether they speak English fluently. We, our research does not go there. We go more into looking at how language appears and how it plays out. So here's where we are, and that's a nice panoramic view of my hometown, um, of Medellin, but um, the local, some of the local folk would pronounce it Medellin, like the word gene there, so that's why I did that little pronunciation thing. Medellin is the second largest city in the country, and it's a city that is facing a larger number of immigrants and tourists who are arriving in the city, who are settling in the city. So that is bringing a very different um, perspective to our languages. Um, let me allow, allow me to take, take a moment and introduce very quickly our three research teams. Um, the first team, the phrase one, which is the one I'm going to be presenting for the most part today, um, were five student researchers. They are all pre service teachers in English Spanish education at, the, at my university. Um, right now, we have two research teams working, one on the uh, second phase of the Urban Literacy Project, that there are seven students there, and then um, four students are involved in the Gaming Literacy Project. In addition to this, we have uh, about seven or eight grad students who are doing research on um, school literacies using some of the frameworks that I'm going to introduce in a second. Um, so the first phase of the Urban Literacy Project was looking at what we call the physical spaces of the city. And we call them physical because they're mostly attached to buildings, uh, attached to static events or static places in the city. Um, so we looked at restaurants, advertisements, malls, bookshops, and libraries. Um, and phase two is the one we're um, doing field work on right now. We are looking at the cultural space of the city. So we're looking at, the, at narratives of people who play with language, and we're looking at tattoos, graffiti, fashion, and music. Uh, in the Gaming Literacy Project, we have a pro the first phase of the project, we started looking at the, uh, what we call an audio ethnography of gamers as researchers. Our, one of the uh, strengths of the um, Gaming Literacy Project, actually, is that our researchers are gamers, and they are looking at that they give me a very different perspective about what gaming, gaming entails. And um, for, this, for the first phase of the project, the researchers, um, they started looking at this idea of English as a resource for victory, and we chose four specific kinds of games. The uh, multiplayer online battle arenas, simulators, first person shooters, and mul massively multiplayer online role playing games. Um, 
And based on the decisions, we made, we discarded certain games that have appeared quite often in the literature, for example, like World of Warcraft, and we have moved on to others. Um, conceptually, our project uses this notion called the city of literacy, a, city, uh, a concept that builds from the tradition of new literacy studies and some of the previous research they had done about literacy practice in the city, and it's adding four additional concepts that are helping us understand the complexity of length of um, literacy practices we find in our cities today. So we are relying on concepts such as multimodality, metrolingualism, body language, and super diversity. Each of these concepts brings a particular feature of how we can look at, at languages in a more fluid way, in a more mobile way, and that way we can start looking at the city as what we like to say is a living entity that is constantly interplaying with texts in a place where the texts are there but the city also plays with the text and creates new texts and in that way we understand the city through these spaces as a literacy practice in and of itself. So, let me share with you for a brief moment some of the things we have found in terms of how we begin to understand um, these, these literacy practices in the city. Um, the first thing we have discovered is the need to start breaking those imaginaries that Medellin has to become bilingual, or in general, break the imaginaries that, in the case of Latin America, our cities have to become bilingual. If you know how to look and you know where to look carefully enough, you're going to start finding very interesting examples of English in other languages. We have found examples in French, we have found things in German, and people playing with languages and using references from the internet as another way to start constructing their texts. And we find that languages do coexist. We are not looking necessarily, and this is where we may take a um, particular difference with other areas of research where they look at language interference. We are not concerned with interference, we're concerned with coexistence and how people use the two languages and how sometimes in the use of those languages there might be mistakes or they might be playing with popular culture and popular cultural references from the city but how English and Spanish in this particular case, they seem to be operating together to create a larger uh, landscape of practices. Other things we have found uh, in our research include that first of all, we are finding messages that are far richer from what previous studies have sh shown. Some of the previous research um, mostly seem to link the use of um, English and the use of these practices in, in the city to the use of apostrophes in names as a symbol of status or very, very limited words and phrases, whereas now we're finding something more complex, uh, actual phrases, actual statements that are appearing in different parts of the city. Uh, another thing that has been very surprising to us is how um, there seems to be an emergence of the use of foul language, the use of profanity in the names of brands and stores and restaurants, etc. And what kind of what what it means for people to play with that in a in a, in a different in a second in a, what's in a second language environment and get away with it? Uh, because I actually traced some of the names and they had websites and the net websites actually used the foul language and they worked. And that seems to be like a very normal thing of everyday practice in the city. And then there is also um, an issue of functionality of language and the kinds of reasons we find for people to use um, these languages or two second languages. Um, that is not simply because it's popular or because it's cool, but there are personal reasons behind it. Reasons that reflect family history, heritage, personal narratives, and yes, a feeling with English, which is a very important thing, that people will feel that just because I am not highly proficient or highly fluent, that doesn't mean I cannot play with the language. And I think that's a very important discovery um, 
of our research how people seem to be less afraid to play with language today. Uh, an interesting thing we, we have started to find in our second, in the second phase of research is how the issue of language economy appears as a factor, for example, in the choices people make for tattoos. And I'll explain that very not briefly. I'll take a minute to explain that one. Um, and how people, for example, they realize that if you write the message in English, you need fewer words than you do in Spanish. And how that, for example, and not simply because it's English or because it's popular, but because of the language economy has become a factor in the way or in the reasons why people choose English over other languages. Um, and we have found, we have started to find in our research on video games that sometimes gamers choose to play uh, in English, even if the proficiency is not allegedly high. It, ha it has to do with the access to communities and to the kinds of, in and to escape certain levels of interactions that can happen in, in other communities if they chose a different language. So we start noticing that there, there are very deep reasons for people to choose the language and not and they're not necessarily followed by the traditional understandings of of language. So and I think I'm, we're going to have plenty of time for a, for a very hefty discussion because we're doing very well with timing. Um, where are we today in, our, in this? Um, first, we find ourselves at a crossroads um, because we now want to know how to start translating this into the curriculum and into policy. We are now starting to think very carefully, how do we share these findings, not simply with the academic community, but with the community at large? How do we convey this message about how the city as literacy can be helpful in making decisions for language policy? And in fact, we dare to argue that what we, we also need to start thinking, not just about language policy, but also start thinking of a literacy policy for our countries. Because sometimes it seems that, that in, the, in the push for introducing the language, we forget about all the literacy practices that should be attached to it. And obviously how this translates to the curriculum, how we start using this information to help language teachers in the city. And that leads to the second point in the next slide, which is the new uses for the city as a literacy. Um, we are not going to go and say today that we should build an entire English curriculum where if that's the way you can learn English. But we believe that realizing how much English and how much second, how many second languages are present in the city can become a source of appropriate, a source of appropriation or finding a real sense to appropriate the language. So that way the language doesn't seem that something that is not akin to people or that people shouldn't care about, but we can give people stronger reasons and a more valid rationale for learning the languages. And I think that revalues the city as a site of learning. Because sometimes the school in the city, they seem to be separate from one another. They seem to work as two events that don't necessarily connect with each other. And there is a sense of the critical conscious about how we look at language and look at cities again. And we say that, as I said, our cities are not monolingual. They might not necessarily be multilingual in that very traditional sense, but there are cities where second languages become a communicative resource, a very powerful communicative resource. And that's why you say our cities are polylanguage and multimodal. And we need to acknowledge that in the construct, in the way we look at the city. As a, as a place where we live and as a place where we interact. And again, we bring it back to that um, construction of the curriculum because that, that brings a whole different ball game. And we can start looking at the city as a part of the school where there is a lot of interplay with language. And we can start looking more carefully 
at the idea of coexistence. Because once you look at the issues across languages, you realize that if you were to take on a metacognitive, um, say, perspective, there is a lot of information that you can transfer across first and second languages, and there are a lot of things that you can do to help your students improve their learning. Um, so we have about we're gonna have about 25 minutes for a lot of what I hope will be a very productive chat. So once again, I want to thank you all. I, I was following some of the uh, discussion in the chat, and I saw some very interesting questions there. Uh, for more information about the project, um, you can basically take a look at our website, letterassistingaltiproject.org. Um, check out check us out on Twitter, on Instagram. Check our videos on YouTube. Uh, and I again want to thank you all. And again, I want to take one one moment to thank again my research team because all the pictures that you saw today, all the data that you that I talked about today, was the product of the field work that they conducted in, the, in phase one. I'm not involved in field work now. But the field work in the first phase of the project was entirely the student researchers. So they, they deserve all the credit. They deserve uh, the recognition of, a bit of the hard work they put together to get this project and to get the LSLP running. Uh, now I'm going to leave it. I'm going to move it back to the, um, to the moderator. And I'll be ready to start taking questions from the audience. Do what? Uh, thank you, Dr. Mora, for your insightful and engaging presentation. We now invite Dr. Mora to respond to the questions that participants have generated across the presentation. Please continue to type in your questions in the question and answer session facilitated by Dr. Albers. Thank you, Dr. Mora. That was a very enlightening and very interesting discussion about foreign language and language ecology. We had a number of questions generated by our participants. And one of them asks, in my country, Turkey, English is considered a foreign language. But then, why do some universities or other formal institutions require English as mandatory? You see. Uh, thank you. That's a very good question. And I think that that actually stems from the con some, some of the misunderstandings about what foreign language or second language is. And because once you start mandating it, it, it that gets that gets things more, I mean, it becomes more complicated. In that sense, we say wait, when we talk about second languages, um, we say, well, first of all, it's not about mandating it, it's about giving people a chance to appropriate it, and most importantly, give them a good reason. I think one of the problems of, of many language policies in Turkey, and I know, in, I know that's the case in Colombia, is we tell people to learn it. We tell people to learn this second language. We just never give them a very good reason why. So obviously, when you don't have a very good reason why, there, there begins a sense of resistance. Because I feel that, we feel that even in Colombia, there is resistance to the policies, not because the policy doesn't make sense, or the policy is not, let's say, the, the uh, spirit of the word, it's not, it's not good. It's that we haven't really built a case for why people should learn a second language. And it should go beyond policy, it should go beyond economics. It should go into how the second language, the second language helps you build a better Kind of individual. If we give, and it, it, this, uh, I mean, if we give this a more humane dimension, it's possible that once we give it a more humane dimension to language learning, policy is going to fall more easily and is going to promote better practices. Thank you for that. Um, another question that was generated by our participants was how does research around language ecology help us work with or against standardized measures of language learning, especially for language learners in countries like the U.S. that promote English-only learning? Hmm. That's a really good question. And 
it goes back, I would say it goes back into the sense of balance, the sense of equilibrium that I was talking about. Um, and one of the things that in sense of language ecology, that it, it requires, in order for that to happen, it requires a very particular sense of advocacy, not just at the grassroots level, but some of the, and some of my own research, I tend to say, well, um, universities and colleges of education, we have a moral, a moral imperative and a moral responsibility to promote a very different sense of dialogue about how forcing people to forego one language or for forfeit a language is detrimental to their very participation in society. That if I deny people the chance to use them, with this, and I know, and, I, and I'm very, but I, and I know very well the case of the United States and the English only policies that some of them seem to be driven by this fear of uh, people disrupting English when research proves that people don't want to don't want to forfeit English. They just want to be able to speak English in their in their home in their mother language or the language or their heritage language. So I think the fight, the fight for standardized testing from the central language perspective comes from the notion of what we do at a grassroots level from, yeah, from, yeah, from academia to sustain the, 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 this, language, this linguistic ecosystem. So that there is also a call, as I mentioned in the very last slide, there's a call for advocacy. And the kind of advocacy that we have to engage in um, from different levels to really, to really bring this message in a way that hopefully is clear to, to policymakers. But that's a very long, that's a very long battle ahead. And just as it's happening in the United States, it's happening here. Because here, for example, as I mentioned, we have 67 indigenous languages. And if you read some of the laws of the um, of the Ministry of Education, they seem to be nowhere in the equation. So we talk about English and we talk about Spanish, but we don't really talk about how this, by, or this, what should be a multilingual language policy is going to keep in mind those uh, 71 languages because we have larger problems in the horizon, like the issues of people who speak sign language and then for them Spanish is the second language. How do we operate there? So all these issues bring up uh, a matter of advocacy and how we organize ourselves from the different areas where we can develop that or engage in that sense of advocacy. And we do it, and I repeat, to sustain the environment. Um, Peggy, if I may, I would like to tackle one question that I found very intriguing. Um, I don't know, but I, I, there's a question here from Nicole, from Nicole Pettit about the, let me see if I can find it real quick. It had to do with linguistic landscapes. So if I may, I want to I want to I want to tackle that. I, wanna, I would like to take a stab at that question. Um, Dr. Miller, that's fine. Dr. Alvarez got disconnected. This is Mandy, and I will ask the questions from here if she isn't able to. But if you find that question and would like to respond, that would be great. Yes, because actually, actually, uh, Nicole, thank you for bringing that question up. Uh, because our research is not that far off the idea of linguistic landscaping. Uh, in, I mean, we're not using that particularly. We're not using the concept of linguistic landscapes directly, but I know I know what you're talking about, and it's not very different. In fact, um, I'm very sure that some ideas that we talked about, like metrolingualism, um, they are they seem to be going back and forth because Benny Cook seems to move between linguistics and literacy quite often. Um, we kind of talk about the city of literacy because we really want to go into the literacy strand and keep in mind that that we want to make it more of a semiotic and linguistic and aesthetic dimension that we want to add to this. But one thing that we are contemplating, and I like the question because one of the things we are contemplating, and I'm going to write this also here in the, um, and on the chat, is how we're going to incorporate the idea of soundscaping into this current phase of our research, on the um, research on the, on the cultural spaces. We are trying to figure out how to do it in a way that is not overly intrusive and that might not get us in, ethic, in an ethical quandary. But right now we are worried we, because we, 
we look at the city, but we realize that one of the things we have to do is listen to the city. And figure out a way, I mean, I still try to, and I say this, for example, because if you take our metro, which is our public transportation system, 10 years ago, or 15 years ago, it was very unusual to hear people speak in English. And when, when, you, when you would speak in English, people would look at you like a freak, um, excuse my language. But I've noticed in recent interactions, and I noticed that uh, sometimes when I, I used to take the metro with my wife, because we both speak English because we got married in the States, um, we would speak in English, and you have, instead of people looking at you weird, you would have people eavesdropping on you. And that's a big, a big shift on how people perceive second language in the city, that now is not something that people chastise, but people pay attention to. So the, the soundscaping matter, it's, it is a question we are we're really thinking hard, long and hard on how to do it. I mean, we want to do it, we just haven't figured out how to do it. And I can solemnly promise all of you that as soon as we have that answer, uh, we will let you know. But I think that was a very, very interesting question about uh, linguistic landscaping. Are there any other questions? Yes, thank you, Dr. Mora. Um, another question we received was, how does code switching fit into your discussion of foreign language? Mm, I'm not sure if foreign languages really keep in mind the notion of code switching. Because uh, if you look at the more at the foreign language the concept, they kind of require you to stick as much as you can into that limited practice of that language. Whereas in the concept of second languages, as we pluralize it, in wow, that's a very good question, by the way. Um, since second languages seem to be something that the user, the people themselves, will choose what the second language looks like and how it operates, this idea of code switching can become a necessary tool for comfort. Um, for, even for intercultural communication, we have we keep finding examples of code mixing and code switching in our in our research. And for me, when I mean code switching, is what I what I was calling before this language coexistence. Because I I'm really I I really opposed to looking. I mean, I know some people have built an entire body of research about linguistic interference. I personally prefer to look at coexistence because. I find that code switching is a very valuable, can be a very valuable tool, and even if you know how to give it a pedagogical twist, it can actually be very useful in helping your students gain confidence in the use of the second language. And there is a vast body of research in my legal education that proves that code switching can be a very useful pedagogical tool if properly used. Thank you. I have another question if you're up for it. <laughs> okay. Yes. I wonder if English is tied to an ideology of economic advancement. Does English equal money? Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, let's not, um, let's, we have to keep it real. Uh, and yes, that is an ideological matter there. And that when I when I was bringing back when I talked about the issue of why uh, a lot some of the policies around the world when it comes to English are driven by economics, but the problem is while economics are important for people, um, people operate with may operate with different standards, and you can push English as an economic tool, but that doesn't mean people are willing to welcome it with open arms. Because we, as I said, we haven't given people a, a real valid reason for why second languages are going to really make their life better. And I don't mean this in the sense of you're going to make more money. Money is important and we all need it. But there has to be something bigger and larger in the sense of why we appropriate languages. So, yes, there is an ideological matter. And, um, I probably am not the first person to say this. I mean, Pennicook was one of the one. He actually denounced this in his work on critical linguistics a long time ago. So I'm not saying something that scholarship hasn't denounced before. But in that sense, um, the recognition of this ideology can become a source for us 
to give people a better, and again, I'm going to go back into that word, you know, that humane dimension of language learning that is so absent sometimes from the curricula and from policy. It's important to think of economy, but that cannot be the only driving force behind pedagogical decisions. Okay, thanks, Dr. Mora. I'm back. I'm sorry I got kicked off. We have another question from another participant who asks, language as a resource is critical. However, how does one convince policymakers that languages other than English are resources for English-speaking populations? And how does one get through this very powerful position that English has in the world? Um, okay, that's a very converted question, so let me try to tackle it. Um, I would say, I'm going to begin with part two, and I would say well, this reminds me of a very long argument I used to have with my advisor with the um, metaphor of you can use the master's tools to dismantle the master's home. For me, you can use the master's tools to dismantle the master's home. And in what I'm saying is that we can use English, I'm going to say against English for lack of a better word, but you can use English as a way to prove that English is not the only way, is not, is not the only one. Since English is going to be more widespread, maybe, and this again is, is a whole issue of advocacy, on, it's a multi, it's a multi-layered approach. But one thing we could do is those of us, and I'm going to say for example, in countries like Latin America, those of us who have the command of English, we have to use that to promote the counter narratives of people who may not have the access otherwise. And that is the first way to start creating the consciousness that languages are other resources. Uh, another important thing that has, to, that has to do with policy, but it's also involved with the curriculum, it's how we build the curriculum in a way, the language curriculum and the curriculum in general, in a way that languages within the curriculum are very more resources for people to use how we enable spaces in the classrooms for people to use those languages that they find as valuable resources. And we also have to break the imaginary that you have to be quote unquote proficient in a language to be able to use it. Um, I think as long as you find a, find a sense of usefulness for the few words that you know in a language, and you can use those words within your larger discourse, you somehow speak and you somehow use the language, and that, that deserves validation. That deserves recognition. Because sometimes, and especially in the sense of how we understand, in, when it comes to policy again, how we understand, for example, bilingualism. Because bilingualism seems to be understood as, as something that is very monolithic and only like a one-size-fits-all approach or a one-size-fits-all definition. So, and that is a very long road ahead. That is a long uphill battle that we have, we all, and I say, when I say we, it's not an editorial we, it's not a, a collective we, it's a real we because I am deeply invested in those questions you're asking about language as a resource, uh, the issues of policy, the issues of ecology. I think those are very important matters, and those are matters that within the research team, gradually, we are beginning to tackle. Okay, so did you... Did you want me to repeat the first part of the question, or do you think you, did you want to answer any more about that first part about policymakers? How do we talk to policymakers? Well, I, I think the first thing we have to do is maybe go talk to them. I, I mean, at least in my experience in Colombia, I have found that sometimes, for, for whatever reason, sometimes universities and, and policymakers don't talk. They just sometimes don't. And I wonder to what extent what we need to do is actually approach them. I mean, that, would, that, may, sound, that may sound really naive to me, but sometimes I, and I, because I have, I have conversations with people from the Ministry of Education, I realize that sometimes 
um, academics don't not don't don't reach out to them. And sometimes when so I think it's a matter of reaching out and, and forcing forcing this conversation at a very grassroots level, but we have to enforce the conversation so they start listening to our research. And um, I'm going to pick up on what Nicole is writing here about professional organizations. And I think professional organizations have a responsibility to take stock on these matters. OK, that's fantastic. So I guess we'll go back to Nicole's question then. I wonder about the role of professional organizations in equipping teachers and faculty and grad students in learning how to advocate with policymakers. Do you have any suggestions, Dr. Mora? Uh, yes, yes. Um, and that question uh, maybe hits close to home because I am a professor in the Faculty of Education. So I work and I coordinate a master's program. And those issues of how um, how to advocate, they're, they're pressing matters. Um, and I think the first thing we have to do is we have to the issue of advocacy and the issues of uh, policy have to be part of the curriculum. We cannot detach the curriculum from advocacy. And there are different levels of advocacy. I mean, I'm not necessarily expecting te uh, like pre-service teachers to go all out and do some of the, or try to wage some of the battles that I, as a, as a researcher, as a university professor, I'm supposed to wage. But there are certain levels of conscious of consciousness raising that they can do from the beginning of their career, and then, then we have to we have to start realizing okay what are the layers of advocacy that we need? What are the layers of advocacy that we have to establish at the pre-service level, at the in-service level, at the graduate level, at the doctoral level, and in begin by infusing the curriculum, just as we have infused our curriculum, our, our curricula with this heavy research component that we find across pre-service programs and graduate programs, we can gradually, within our coursework, include something as simple as discussions and readings about how to, I mean, about advocacy and policy, and start from there. I mean, sometimes we have to find simple solutions and start and start building from there. And I think the simple solution to start, from, to start with that is how we infuse it in the curriculum and how professional organizations um, who are constantly making statements, make sure those statements make it to the desks of the policy makers. And, don't, and then we can start thinking of what other levels we need and what kind of, for example, what kind of research we need to do and how we need to present it because maybe we have to present in academic journals, but we also have to start finding more alternative outlets for the presentation of our findings so that they are more accessible to the public. Thank you for that. Um, could you talk a little bit about your research project and do you feel that your research project is having an effect in your country, Colombia, in terms of how it views language as a college? Uh, oh, okay. Uh, our project we have been work. Um, LSLP has been around for three years, but we, I would say the heavy bulk of work we have done was has basically been 2013, 2014, and this first semester. We are gradually beginning to be seeing that work. So right now, I would say the effect is something that we have to start showing because. We have been trying to build the case first and build um, build a robust body of research. But in general, um, one interesting thing is that the field of literacy research at large is a very is very much uncharted territory in this country. I mean, there are other pressing matters in language education, and there are other pressing matters for the language teaching community. Literacy is a topic that people are just beginning to recognize. I mean. People are beginning to understand how it has to do with language, and it has to do with learning, and it also can, and it has to do with policy. And it's, but it has been a very slow process. Um, and I feel that the more we start presenting this uh, locally and internationally, that is going to give us, you know, um, 
enough chips to bargain, and it's going to help us create a sense of gravitas that then we can later translate into curriculum, into policy. But it has I mean, we have started really, I would say if we have started small scale, and we're now starting to grow little by little, um, and I would say that way, presenting our work in an outlet like GCLR and some of the publications we've done recently, is helping us establish that we have a body of research that can become useful. And we, as we go, we probably, we probably begin to start finding um, particular allies in different areas in the country that can help us disseminate the message. That's great. Thank you, Dr. Mora. It does take time for impact to happen, and sometimes impact doesn't always happen, even with the best of efforts. So it's really encouraging to know that we need to continue to pursue that avenue of pushing policymakers towards helping us understand language learning and uh, providing legislation that will give us the, what do I want to say, that give us the, the liberty to work with language as a resource. So that actually concludes our Q&A, Dr. Mora. I am going to pass this back to Tuba. And again, thank you very much for an enlightening presentation. Thank you. The pleasure was all mine. Thank you again, Dr. Mora, for your passion and interest in understanding the literacies in second languages and multilingual literacy practices in today's world. We would appreciate you taking a moment to type into the chat area one thought about this web seminar. Please help support the GCLR research project by taking the GCLR survey. The link is located on the home page of the GCLR website. Additionally, if you are willing to participate in a 15 or 20 minute interview about the GCLR, please type your name and email address into the chat area and someone from the research team will contact you within a few days to schedule an interview. We also have a doctoral mentoring web seminar series with two feature presentations. Please share this information with your students and colleagues. We want to thank GCLR audience for participating in the 2014 and 2015 series of seminars. Please look for updates on the list of speakers for the 2015 and 2016 series. On behalf of the entire GCLR research team and me, Tuba Angai Crowder, thank you for joining us today.